someone actually asked once once asked me if I feel nervous and pressure when I speak to groups and I thought about it and I thought well when it's about my ego when I want people to think I'm great and I'm a good speaker then I get nervous but when it's about just sharing beautiful wisdom and empowering people I don't get nervous because why would I I got an opportunity to really help people and spread Torah and Judaism so there's nothing to be nervous about so I've got some very sweet things to share so I, so there's no pressure here. Great. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. You ready? So let's go. You're on. Come on. I'm so, so very quickly, very quick introduction. So I'm not just a random uh, British man speaking at you through Zoom. I grew up in England, not in a religious family. And I did philosophy at Manchester University which was really a bit of a waste of time. And I started just asking people how they are, how are you? And most people gave answers to the effect of not too bad, getting by, hanging in there, could be worse, can't complain. And I realized that's not what life needs to be about. I got to live with purpose and find out what I'm trying to achieve and how to achieve it. I speak to many people and I ask what they want and they say, I want to be happy. But it doesn't seem that that many people have worked out how to actually live a happy, meaningful life of vitality. So I went and I lived in Asia for six years, in China and Japan and Korea and India. And I did lots of martial arts and lots of uh, silent meditation retreats, 10 days of silence. And that was an amazing time. But I, I wanted to go and canoe down the Amazon. And I stopped in Israel for three weeks, 13 years ago. And someone said to me, you, you teach Buddhism and Hinduism and all the Eastern paths, but you're Jewish. Why don't you learn about Judaism? And I, I said, Judaism is not very spiritual and uh, I'm, I'm spiritual, but I started learning. And I saw that Judaism has immense, immense, deep, profound wisdom in many, many areas of life. One of them relationships that we're going to be speaking about today. But uh, after a while, I really committed to living a Torah way of life. I, I had asked all my Buddhist masters and my Hindu masters, how do you know this is true? How do you know your philosophy is true? And they, they didn't give me any good answer, really. They said, because Buddha said so, or because I felt it in my meditation. But there's no evidence until I came to Israel and I came to Aish. And I said, well, how do you know this is true? And they say, we have evidence that there's no way a human being could have written the Torah. So I studied the evidence. I actually walked from the Lebanese border to Elat in 40 days. It's about 1,100 kilometers, 700 miles, um, to raise money for orphans. But I was going through the evidence with my atheist friends, and I couldn't refute it. So I decided to live uh, a Torah observant life. And I'm actually going to tell you the story of about how I met my wife, seeing as we're talking about relationships now, just because it's the most unbelievable story about how to two people met and people say don't build it up too much because if you build it up too much uh, then it will be a letdown when you tell it but, but it won't be basically I had now been observant for about two years and I went to someone's house for Friday night dinner and we went around the table and we had to introduce ourselves and someone came up to me halfway through the meal and said you know what your story is amazing you were into Eastern philosophies and martial arts I know the perfect woman for you. She also grew up not religious and she's a yoga teacher and she's an energy healer and she met the Dalai Lama and she's South African. My parents are South African. So he said, she's perfect for you. And I said, okay, great. And he said, one problem is she went back to South Africa last night. <coughs> she was in Israel for a year and she's gone home now, but I'll get you her email address. And I was like, I don't really want an email address. I want to get married now and I don't want a long, long distance relationship. So I kind of left it. I get a phone call on Saturday night after Shabbat and it was this guy and he said, look, I thought you two were so good for each other that I called her just in case, you know, I got the date wrong and she picked up the phone. And what had happened was she went to the airport. I'm telling this story very short, by the way, but she went to the airport and she got to the front of the queue and they said to her, oh, I'm sorry, this, your flight was rescheduled. And she was like, oh, wow, when, when's it leaving? And, and they said, it left last night. 
I've never heard of that happening before. I don't know if you've heard of that happening before, but it left last night. They hadn't informed her. So they said, we'll put you on the flight on Sunday. And so she came back to Jerusalem and she thought, okay, for some reason, obviously Hashem wants me to stay in Jerusalem for one more Shabbat. At which point she gets the call on Saturday night from this guy saying, I've met the perfect guy for you, which is very cool. But he said to us, we've got to meet to now because she's leaving tomorrow. So we met on that on Saturday night straight away. And basically I knew within about three minutes that she was my wife. I think she's still trying to decide about me. We got three children already. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, I'd been on, I'd been set up with seven girls dates before and very short, very soon after the beginning of the day, I thought, I'm, I'm, I don't think this is my wife with this girl. I was like, I'm sure this is my wife. So we met and it was great. And then on Sunday, we met again in the morning and I said, maybe we should try and postpone your flight. You know, we just met now. And it's very intense to do that after one day, especially when you're like belt shoovers. So anyway, she said, okay, so let's do that. And she went to the LL offices and she sat down and it got to her turn. And she said, I want to postpone my flight. They said, which flight? She said, the flight to Johannesburg tonight. And they looked and looked and they said, oh, we're so sorry, madam but it seems like they forgot to put you on tonight's flight. You aren't going to Johannesburg anyway. <laughs> two, strike two for me. So we met again that day. <laughs> uh, you see, Hashem runs at LL, so he, he can make it happen. <laughs> so then we met, and on Tuesday, I, she went back to South Africa, and I went to England to spend Hanukkah with my parents. And... Long story short, I was telling my mom, I said, Mommy, I met a girl. She's an amazing girl. She's South African, yoga teacher. And my mom, after a while, said, hold on a second, what's her name? And I said, Oriana. At which point my mom jumped up and she said, it's Bichette. It's meant to be. And I was like, what? Are you a prophetess, Mommy? What? A Kabbalist? How do you know? So apparently three months earlier in October, she had been in South Africa and she was having lunch with her best friend from school. And she was talking about me and her best friends from school's daughter-in-law came in and sat down and my mom was talking about me. And she said, oh, wow, well, my best friend, Oriana, is in Israel. She sounds perfect for your son. So my mom knew about Oriana long, long, long time before I, I met her. So that was the next story. Very long story short. I basically, we were speaking the next week. I was in London. She was in South Africa. And she said to me, how do you think it's going? You know, should we carry on dating? And I said something. <laughs> I said, I think we're going to get married in June, which really freaked her out. And she put the phone down and I found someone else on J-Date. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, I didn't. It, did freak her out. it freaked her out a little bit, but she remembered, and this is unbelievable, she remembered that earlier that year, in May that year, she'd been on a camping trip with a seminary and she'd had a dream that she was going to get married in June the next year. Anyway, so very long story short, she, she was away for two months and then we met. She came back to Israel and we dated for about three weeks and then we got engaged and then about... Five days after we got engaged, I went to India for two months because I used to run programs in India for Israeli backpackers. And I arrived back in Israel about three weeks before the wedding, which was in June, June the 29th, uh, Baruch Hashem. So that's our story. We, yeah. from, the, from the time we met to the time we got married was about six months, four months not in the same country. And I always say that there's something very powerful about religious dating. Because in religious dating, you're not, you're not, there's no physicality. So you can really concentrate on what counts in a relationship. How are you going to build a good relationship? So I'm just going to share with you the five, five main things I believe are very important in a relationship, whether you're looking for a relationship or you're already in a relationship. These are the five things to be able to create a healthy, meaningful, long-lasting, sweet, conscious, beautiful relationship. Um, and we've got to define really in Judaism, what is a marriage? What is, what is a relationship all about? And a marriage is really a commitment to maintaining emotional intimacy. That's what a marriage is. We want to have emotional intimacy. We want to feel close to each other. We want to feel connected 
in our marriage. So how are we going to do this? We're going to need these key things. Number one key thing that our relationship really needs to be based on is similar values. Do we have the same values? Uh, intellectually, are we lined up? Really, in life we have intellect and emotion and then physicality. So where I grew up, and before I was religious, most relationships are really based on physicality. You know, you're, you're physically attracted to each other. Um, I heard there's a saying in America, I don't know if this is true, but the two things you don't talk about on a first date are religion and politics, <laughs> which means your values and what you believe. <laughs> so Judaism is the opposite. Judaism says no. What you want to do is you want to have a relationship that is based on similar goals, similar values. What do you find important? And because it doesn't define you fully, but your values define you to a large extent. For example, if you only had one question, you were going to date someone and you only had one question, this does happen in some parts of the Jewish world, I believe, but you only have one question. What's that one question that you want to ask that person? What's your favorite movie? How much money do you have? That's not the one question. The one question you want to ask someone to really get to know them is, what do you value? What's important? What do you want in your life? Do you want to have a Torah home? Do you, uh, do you value living in Israel very much? You've got you to know for yourself what your values are. I actually gave a, a, a class to some singles two weeks ago. And very often, when people are dating, they say, what do I want in the other person? What am I looking for in someone else? I'm looking for this, and then they've got to be this, and they've got to be that. And the truth is, before we even start that, you have to ask yourself the question, what am I looking for in myself? What am I looking for in myself? Who am I? Am I comfortable in my own shoes? Do I have a sense of self-respect, self-confidence? Do I know who I am? <laughs> She reminded me of a story. My daughter, when she was three or four years old, I was walking her to kindergarten, to Gan, and we saw a picture of a rabbi, Rabbi Odessa, with his hands in the air. And she said to me, who's that? And I said, it's Rabbi Odessa. He's a follower of, of Rabbi Nachman. And she said, okay, who do we follow, Abba? So, so I said, we really follow anyone who's going to help us be better people and connect to Torah and Hashem and other people more. So anyone, whatever, anyone who helps us become better people and connect, that's who we follow. So she said, I like that, Abba. So I said, okay, but I want you to know that it's your own personal relationship with Hashem. So when you get a bit older, you can choose who you want to follow. If you want Chabad or Brethlev or Yeshivish, whatever, you've got to choose your own relationship with Hashem. So she thought about it for a bit and then she looked up at me and she said, Abba, maybe I'll follow whoever my chatan follows. <laughs> I will follow whoever my groom. I get married and whoever he follows, I'll follow him. So I said to her, I hear that. That's an idea. But maybe it would be a better idea for you to work out for yourself who you follow first. And then you can find a chatan based on that. You'll find your chatan, he also chose the same path to follow, and that is good. And she was like, okay, I, I hear that, Abba, but I like how we do it. I like following whoever's going to help me. I said, great, follow whoever you like, as long as you don't follow the Sahara. You don't follow negativity, but you can follow who you like. So this is very important for you, sorry, before even these five things, is you've got to work out your own values. You've got to work out what I believe in, what's very important to me. My wife and I, we are exactly, exactly, exactly the same in terms of our values. We value Torah and, and we value joy in our home and we value nature and we value living in Israel. We have the very same values. Our personalities are exactly with the two most opposite people in the world. She's a grown-up, basically, <laughs> which really helps when it comes to feeding the children. <laughs> but basically, she's a, she's a yoga teacher, elegant, very amazing, mature, womanly angel. And I'm this crazy little kind of me. And that works really to get well together, by the way. She needs my energy. I need her energy. But when it comes to our values, that's what makes the relationship very strong. Don't say, I'll work out, we'll work out our values together as we go along. It doesn't work. 
So number one thing, you've got to work out what's important to me, what, what do I value? And then you can get an emotional intimacy based on your values, not on physicality. I don't know if you've noticed this ever, but there might be someone you're very physically attracted to, but then they say something very disgusting or racist, or, and you actually become physically less attracted to them. Or there's someone who you're not so attracted to, but you get to know them, and the more you get to know them and see that they're sweet and compassionate and kind and wonderful, you actually feel more physically attracted to those people. So you can have emotional and physical attraction really based on we have the same values. So that's your number one rule. Work out for yourself your values and find someone in line with those values. Number two, my wife and I, we've been married for 13 years now and we've never had an argument. In 13 years, not one, we've upset each other. We've had differences of opinion, but we've never had an argument. And, and the reason is because we never, ever, ever, ever speak to each other. <laughs> Do you want to hear the real reason why in 13 years of marriage we've never argued? Yes. It's because we never, you, re, you with me? We never, ever, 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 ever put each other down. We never put each other down. We use this tool. It's a crazy idea, but it's called, you won't believe this, by the way, it's called grown-up communication. <laughs> it's a crazy idea. And the first rule of grown-up communication is never, ever put each other down. Never. However upset, angry, hurt, Never say you're such a this. I don't even say to my wife, what's wrong with you with that face? What's wrong with you? Why would you do that with that attitude and that face? God forbid you should do that to any human being, by the way, but especially to someone you want to create emotional intimacy with. So this means that you're going to have to have some self-control. It means that when you're feeling very hurt, when you're feeling very upset, when you're feeling very angry, very frustrated, You've got to not talk then. It doesn't, it's not going to be okay. So what you need to do is get some space and take some breaths and really, really, really calm yourself down. And once you're calm and you're not so upset and you're not so hurt anymore, then you can come and communicate with each other. And there's a way of communicating which involves no blame. I'm not blaming you. I don't think you're bad. I don't think you're wrong. You've got to remember that if you're in a healthy relationship, the other person didn't want to hurt you. It was a mistake. We hurt each other because we're not perfect. By the way, if you're in a relationship with someone who does want to hurt you, we should talk about that and how to get out of that. But in general, they don't want to, I don't, my wife, I never want to hurt my wife. So when I do, just because I make mistakes and I'm human, we've got to know that we're communicating and we're not blaming and we're not saying, I don't like you and you're bad. So this is what we do. My wife and I, we have two methods. They're very similar. What we do is called nonviolent communication. You can actually look this up, NVC, nonviolent communication. And it's saying, look, I observe. I observed something. I'm not saying you're bad. For example, I'm going to pick a completely random example. I see that you leave your socks lying around. A completely random example. <laughs> That's what someone might say. And then you, once you said an observation, you say how it makes you feel, how it makes me feel. I'm not blaming you. You're not bad. I feel. So when you leave your socks lying around, it makes you feel you disrespect the house or you disrespect me and you expect me to pick your socks up for you and I'm your... I'm your cleaning lady and a very random example I'm using here with the, all the details. And so I just observed that you leave yourselves lying around and it makes me feel like this. And then you say a need. I need to keep the house clean. I have a need to feel respected. And then a request. Please, would you try and pick your socks up more often? That's why I don't wear socks anymore. Because I... <laughs> I really don't. Some people call me Rabbi Dove Barefoot. 
because I don't like wearing shoes. Right. So, by the way, we can talk about that because the truth is, you, you, this is, goes true for your children and for everyone. You've got to validate someone's feelings. So, so if someone says, I feel like this, you shouldn't say, well, you shouldn't feel like that. You shouldn't even say that to yourself, by the way. I don't know if you've ever felt upset about something. And then you said to yourself, I really shouldn't feel upset by this. Well, how did that help? Now you're upset that you're upset. So feelings need to be validated. So once someone's really shared their feelings, then that deals with most of the issue. Then you don't need to fight. You don't need to argue about it. This is just how I feel. The truth is, I was leaving my socks lying around for 20 years before I met my wife. So it's got nothing to do with not respecting her. So she can start working on realizing that is not a lack of respect, but I have to start working on picking my socks up. And that's how everyone in the relationship is doing their part in the relationship. And that's very, very healthy. And then we switch. We say, okay, I noticed this. Another way to do this is a bit shorter. And we used to do this every Thursday night was we, have, we played the three question game, clearing. My wife used to be a social worker. So it's called the clearing game. And my wife would say to me, Dovey Bear, we need a clearing. I felt like I was going to the principal's office, by the way. I was like, oh. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so the clearing goes like this. The first question is, what's not working for you in our relationship? What's not working for you? Well, I don't like how you leave your socks lying around. I don't like, and some things, by the way, it's not your fault. I don't like how you come home late from work. So I'm not blaming you. It's just, I, it doesn't work for me so well. Um, the second, and by the way, then the other person answers the question and they say, this is not working for me. This is, and, and the questioner can't interrupt and say, well, you do. Blah, 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 blah. The, just let that person express. Second question is what is working for you? This is positive reinforcement. Very nice. What is working for you in our relationship? Well, I love the way you make tea and you do this for me and it's very wonderful. And the last question is, what are you holding on to? What are you holding on to? Which is different. The first one is kind of habits. And the second one is, well, last Monday you said this and it made me feel like this or whatever. So we started, we did that every Thursday night to get ready for Shabbat. But now we do it more naturally so we don't hold on to things. And so we just say, look, I need to clear the fact that you did this and it made me feel like this and it's all good. So communication is the key, is the key to everything. Fine. Are there any questions so far? You can communicate with me in a non-violent way. If you want <laughs> yes, please. Um, I actually had two, but for the sake of time, I can always ask some later. But like, what do you do? Like, okay, the values are the same. But then say you get married and then the values change or the person is not who they seem to be or who they portray to be because cohabitation is not allowed before marriage or they're not, they become less from or what do you do? Uh, I, I know. Yeah, that's, that's very, very difficult. The truth is, it's very, very rare for someone to change their core values. It is very rare, but it's a problem. It is a problem when they do. If suddenly my wife just stopped being from at all, that would cause a serious problem in that relationship. And we'd have to think about that. The truth is, if we have the second tool I spoke about, which is good communication, hopefully we could work it through in a, in a healthy way. Um, but you're right. If, if suddenly one completely loses everything and the other one keeps something, then... Because they say you don't know the person until they get married. And then when you get married, they're not the same. They change or something. I don't know. True. That's why I think that we shouldn't rush into getting married. <laughs> I think in some circles, it's a very rushed thing. You know, let's meet and within two months and stuff. But the truth is... That if someone is very, very committed to Torah, I've noticed, and truth, to Torah and truth, then this is why the dating is much more healthy. Because we haven't been intimate physically, and when you're going into a date in, in religious dating, the guy isn't thinking, what do I have to say to get her to come home with me? And so you're actually talking about real things in an honest, open, and vulnerable way. It's an it's an immensely healthy way to start a relationship. And just kind of on that topic is people say, you know, how can I marry someone 
if I, I, we haven't been physically intimate together, how do we know if it will work and all those things? And once again, the truth is, once your relationship is based on values and communication, even if there is a problem in that area, then you'll work on it and you can talk about it. And, and it's very rare that that is actually a problem in general, especially when once we have the other few things that I'm going to speak about now in place, you're going to see it creates a whole picture. So once you've got these things in place and you're really getting to know that person and opening and being vulnerable together, then, then it, we're putting all the factors in place that we need for it to work. And we can see statistically that the secular world isn't doing particularly well and they live together for three years and then they get married and then they get divorced a month later. So I don't think the other system is good, but you're right. Sometimes it, divorce, unfortunately, it, it, there's a mitzvah to get divorced when you need to get divorced. Um, but it's a mitzvah we never want to do and it was never in my vocabulary. I was like, so, someone said to me the other day, well, if it doesn't work out, we'll get divorced. I was like, that's so sad. <laughs> that's such a sad way to approach the thing. So, so we, have, we have deep, deep, deep commitment to making it work. In fact, I'm going to share, this is basically the next one, which is deep commitment to growth. Deep commitment to making things work. You have to be someone and you have to be married to someone who is deeply committed to do whatever it takes to make it work and not throw it out as soon as we see any sign of any weakness. In fact, you shouldn't try and do this, but if you're dating someone and you haven't had a, a problem that you've overcome, yeah, obviously don't try and cause the problem. <laughs> But I'm much happier when my students say to me, we had a falling out or we had a very strong difference of opinions, but we worked it through. That's very good. Because as you say, once you get married, there's going to be stuff. So if you didn't have some stuff to work through while you're dating, it's, I prefer it when you do, just so you know that we are people committed, which means that I'm going to therapy if I need to go to therapy and I'm open to going to couples therapy. Uh, or, or at least have a mentor between us. I know people who are married to people, and usually it's the, the man's problem, but I, I, it's changing a lot. I, I know this guy who wants to go to therapy with his wife just to improve it in some ways, and she refuses to. She says it's taboo. If anyone finds out we're in therapy, it would be over. That's not a good sign. You have to be someone who's deeply, deeply committed to inner work, growing, and deeply committed to making it work. I'm going to do whatever, whatever it takes to make this relationship work. So once you've got the same values, and once you communicate in a very, very healthy way, and once you're never putting each other down and making each other feel bad, you're always uplifting each other, and you're committed to making it work, you've got a very, very, very strong foundation, very strong foundation to make anything work. Because you can, it's really up to you. Rab Noach Weinberg, who said Ab Aish, who was just his yacht side last week, said that says that love is the feeling you get from focusing on the good qualities in us in another person. So you, it's your choice. You can fall into love and fall out of love, but Jews we don't fall in and fall out of love. Jews we create a lasting, deep, real love based on focusing on the goodness in people. So you can, you can learn to love anyone, really. You can learn to love anyone, obviously not some awful, disgusting, abusive, whatever, but in general, love, if love is focusing on the good, what happens, by the way? What happens? People get married. Why do they get divorced? It's usually because they've stopped focusing on the good and they're starting to focus on the not so good in the other people. So if you can be someone who's always looking for the good, I've actually, my wife and I have got a list. Oh, this is maybe a sixth point. <laughs> my wife and I, I've got a list of all the wonderful things I love about my wife. And I add to it. And memories, good memories. And, and I add to that list. And it means I'm always, always looking for the good in my wife all the time. And through that, I maintain a feeling of love for my wife. Are there, is there anything wrong with my wife? The truth is no, <laughs> but let's say most relationships, 
let's say in the most relationships, there are some things wrong, serious things like uh, attitude things and not so serious things like I don't like the way you eat or how you laugh or whatever like that. So when you were dating, you saw them eating like that or laughing like that, but you ignored it because you liked the way that they were a mensch. But suddenly you get married and you stop focusing on the fact that they're a mensch and it really annoys you how they eat. What happened? Just your perspective. You started focusing on the negative rather than the positive. So if you could have a list of things you like, and this is for you, this isn't to share with them. That's another, there's another good tool, which is to tell the other person what you like about them. But this is a tool for yourself to be able to focus, sharp, sharp focus on the, all the good in someone else. And then you can love them, truly. Be'ez rest Hashem. So fine, that was another, that was a side one. Focus on the good in other people. And by the way, the key to being able to focus on the good in someone else is to be able to focus on the good in yourself. If you, we say in the Torah, kamocha. You should love your fellow as yourself, but that means kamocha, as yourself. You have to love yourself first, which goes back to what I said at the very, very beginning of the class, which is you have to have a strong sense of self and a strong sense of your values and a strong sense of self-respect so that when you are dating someone, you're not trying to impress them. You're trying to see if they deserve you. I feel good about myself, but I'm not relying on external recognition for my sense of self. I've got a strong sense of self based on, a, on my values and I'm trying to live up to my values and I'm a good person. And that makes dating easier because you, you, you walk in with not arrogance and also lot, not low self-esteem, but a, but a healthy sense of self, um, which makes you be able to date better. Fine. So growth, growth orientated. You both got to be people who are, who are, are not going to bail as soon as things get tough. And we, we always learn that most growth comes through difficult times. So, so difficulties in your marriage are an opportunity to build much greater emotional intimacy because if you can overcome the difficulties and be there for each other and understand each other and not blame each other, your marriage is going to be much, much, much better. Your relationship is going to be better. Once your relationship has survived the storm, it's a stronger relationship. Next one. Number four is the Jewish idea that the number one main key character trait and attitude that someone has to have in life is chesed, loving kindness, giving, giving. You want to be in a relationship with someone who wants to give, I'm in it. I want to invest in someone else. It's immensely important. My students often come up to me and say, Rabbi, how do I know I'm ready to get married? And the answer is, when are you ready to give up your own needs to some extent to serve someone else? You're not getting, if you're getting married for yourself and what's in it for me and I can get this and it's a very, very unhealthy relationship. A relationship of two people who are self-centered and taking for themselves is unhealthy because they start saying, you're not putting your weight and you're not doing what you said you'd do. But a relationship of two people who are completely committed to investing in the other person, very healthy, very beautiful and healthy relationship. So you want to find someone who's in it for you. I want to give, I want to expand my sense of self. We have this idea, Rabbi Tatz writes about this, I think, in World Mask, that there are obligations and rights, rights and obligations. And they're opposite, they're opposite sides of the coin. My right to life is your obligation not to kill. And my right to my property is your obligation not to steal. So in the, in the Western secular world, it's all about rights, the Bill of Rights and human rights and rights, rights, rights. The Torah never speaks about rights. It doesn't speak about human rights. It speaks about obligations. I have an obligation to you. Now, obviously, if I have obligations, then you have rights. They come hand in hand, rights and obligations. But why does the Torah talk about obligations and not rights? Because rights is self-centered. What's in it for me? What's my right? I have a right to this in our relationship. But if you're rather focusing what's, what's my obligation, 
What do I, what am I expected? What's expected for me in this relationship? And you just go about completely trying to fulfill your obligation to the other person. Then that's going to create a very, very, very wonderful relationship. So if you're a giver and they're a taker, it, it can't work so much. If you're, if, if you're both takers, it's definitely going to work. So we want to try and create a relationship of two people giving. And once you see yourselves as a single entity, then of course you want to give. Giving to your partner is giving to yourself because you want your partner to be happy and, and fulfilled. I actually told my wife, it's a very important other, other work for everyone, is you need to have a list of things that make you feel nurtured. Hot bath with lavender oil, uh, foot massage, walk in nature, glass of wine with my friends, listening to nice music. And you really have to invest in nurturing yourself just so you feel emotionally taken care of and you feel good. And the partner has to be like an accountability partner. So once in a while I say to my wife, well, what have you done to, for yourself? How have you nurtured yourself today? What can I get for you? So I'm always investing, investing in my wife's happiness and investing in getting her to invest in herself as well. Very important. And it's the same for me. She always asks me, do I want a cup of tea? What do I need? So we're very, very focused on each other's well-being. So that's the next one. You have to be a giver and you have to be with a giver. The last one, which is very, very important, but it's not what it's based on is chemistry. You've got to like, you've got to have some physical attraction. In fact, you're not allowed to marry someone that you're not physically attracted to. So there has to be that element of, I just like the person. There's some chemistry here. I think about them when we're not together. So lots of people ask me when they're dating, you know, he's a really great guy. I really like it. You know, he's a, he seems he's got lots of good character traits and we have the same values. Uh, but I always say to them, yeah, but do you like him? <laughs> and often they're like, no, not really. There's nothing wrong with him. I just, you know, do you think about him when you're not together? Do you think about her when you're not together in a positive way? And if you don't, it can't work. So that's essential, but it's not the first, it's not the main criteria. But it's very, very important. And how, much, how attracted do you have to be to them? You have to be attracted enough once again, attraction can grow, but they don't have to be the most stunning person ever. And often if they are, that takes away from your, your judgment intellectually of who you should be with. But someone who you, who you feel good, to, you, you, you're attracted to them. And nice. So those are the five keys. Five keys, a healthy relationship is that we're based, we're based on the same values. And that we are communicating in a healthy grown-up way. We never put each other down. We express how we feel. And we give the other person a space to express how they feel without, with no judgment. And then that we're both growth orientated. We're trying to work on ourselves and we're trying to work on the relationship to become better and better. So my wife and I, we learn marriage books together uh, over breakfast. We read different ways of connecting and and different ways of communicating and things because we're, we're invested in the relationship. If you're invested in anything, you're going to do the research to understand it more. Then next one is chesed, giving. I want to be there for you. I'm not, I'm not self-centered. I'm not living only for myself. I want to invest in you. And the final one is attraction. I'm attracted to each other. And then the Jewish, Jewish practice has really set up a system of maintaining this. We have, we have the system of, of family purity. Family purity is an amazing uh, structure of keeping the respect alive and keeping the intimacy, all of the, the physical and emotional and intellectual and spiritual intimacy is, is kept alive by this. Um, I remember one time, I, it was the time of month when my wife and I couldn't touch each other and she was very upset about something. She was crying about it. And I really sat there for many hours talking to her. And she said to me the next day, I just want you to know that you hugged me without hugging me. <laughs> it's an amazing thing for a relationship when you can be totally, totally there emotionally for someone without necessarily having the physicality. And it builds that space. It, build, it builds the holiness and it builds the respect. 
And then, no, I think we ran out of time. Not giving a whole class about this, but in terms of intimacy, it's meant to be an act of giving rather than taking. So, so once again, giving, investing in someone else to, in order to create emotional intimacy. Actually, tonight is, is Tu Bishvat. And Tu Bishvat is the Rosh Hashanah for the trees. And we eat fruit. We eat fruit. And the purpose of eating fruit of the trees is because the original sin in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they ate from the fruit of the tree. And what was the sin? What did they really do wrong? They just took pleasure from the fruit without connecting it to Hashem. The reason Hashem made so many beautiful fruits for us to eat is so that we could get pleasure and use that pleasure as a way to connect to Hashem and say it's amazing, lots of gratitude, I've got taste buds, we've got different fruits. So to have pleasure without connection is cutting you off from spirituality. So what we're trying to do in our relationship is give pleasure to the other person emotionally physically, whatever, give pleasure in order to create a connection. So that must mean that it's coming from a place of, of giving and, and working on, on connection. That's what we're trying to do. Are there any questions? I could ask about that. Go on. So I don't know if this is like the same question. And this for me, I always want to see because I feel like I'm on a safeguard. It's like, do you recommend like, again, premarital counseling? Because that's something... I'm considering doing what I find if I find the right one, but like just to kind of safeguard again to make sure he's the right person is premarital. 100%. 100%. I think that couples before they get married should go to, you don't need to call it therapy if people are scared of the word therapy, but go to your rabbi, go to your rabbi or your rebbitson or your mentor, and it, it really helps to have a third party. When it comes to Jewish law, we have a posek, which means he tells us what the law is. Well, when it comes to marriage, you should have a third party who can guide you, because sometimes you're going to have... Marriage. Pardon? I'm saying before marriage, because say that, then you find out yeah. it's not the right person, and you're saving time, money, and energy. But I say that to people, people are like, but why? But I'm like, think about it, what if it's not the right person, then you fortunately can leave, and it just saves. I don't know. I, I still no, I agree. That. I agree 100%. By the way, by the way, I've never made a shidduch, but I've split up many, and that's equally important. <laughs> 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 okay. I mean, it is. It's equally important. It's equally important because you don't want to be with the wrong person. Just like you want to be with the right person, you don't want to be with the wrong person. So I'm, I'm good at knowing when you're not the right person. I did actually make one, well, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So um, I very much think that there needs to be some if it, there needs to be some third party involvement early on. And by the way, if you suggest it and the other person is like, no way, I think that's a sign that that person's not going to work on it, and that's a bit scary. Yeah, I went. Sorry. You say if you say we should see a third party to help us solidify our relationship. And they say, no, that's really weird. They should be like, oh, great. That's a great idea. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.